Order. It is time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, and we will start with listed questions. But before that, members, I have to tell you that question 1, 5, 7 and 13 have been withdrawn. I call Mr Pat Ramsey. Question 2, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy uh, Speaker, the uh, Deputy First Minister and I remain uh, committed to providing the best services that uh, it is possible to bring for victims and survivors. This includes ensuring they have proper representation and a collective voice uh, through their own commissioner. Unfortunately, the current process has not produced a sizable pool of appointable candidates. We are currently looking at options on how to widen the pool of appointable candidates and will release further details of this very shortly. However, as this is still a live competition, it would not be appropriate to comment further. Call Mr Ramsey for supplementary. Yeah, thank you, and I thank the First Minister for his response. Clearly, there will be victims and survivors across Northern Ireland disappointed that we're not progressing this matter. And we certainly, First Minister, we don't want a rerun of the previous uh, appointment that caused a lot of distress and discomfort to the victors, victims. Can you outline to the House any time frame uh, in terms of going forward, taking the point that there has been delays? Is there any time frame you can assure the House that it's going to happen? Well, uh, I, I don't think I can agree with him about uh, there being uh, any concern uh, about the previous commissioner. Catherine Stone was uh, a first-class commissioner. Uh, I think perhaps he may be referring to the appointment of four uh, commissioners on a previous occasion. And some of them were slightly dodgy, I think, as the, the House will, will, will know. Uh, however, order, please. Order, please. I have to ask. As, uh, order, please. Order, please. Sorry. I'm sorry. I have to ask you to resume your seat. I will not accept any remarks from the senatorly position. Continue. I think the, the point he makes, nonetheless, uh, is important. It is essential that we get this right, uh, that there are people relying on the Commissioner to speak uh, for them, and it has to be uh, a Commissioner that uh, they can identify with. Uh, and that's what the Deputy First Minister and I are working on. In terms of uh, timescale, uh, well, I think it's as soon as possible. We have to, to resolve the issue of whether we widen the, the, the pool, and if so, how we do it. Call Mr Jimmy Spratt. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, ask the First Minister uh, what progress has been made on severely disabled pensions, and uh, will it seek to redefine victim? Well, I think there have been many people who have recognised that uh, when the initial assessments were made uh, for victims uh, at the time of uh, the incident that affected their lives, in some cases, if not on most cases, there was not the expectation that some of these victims would have still been alive today. And that's the blunt truth. Uh, and therefore, I think the assessments were less than were necessary. Uh, for them to have a, a full life for a prolonged period of time. Uh, in that context, my colleagues and I have uh, been consulting on a bill that would uh, come before the Assembly that would provide a pension uh, for those who are severely uh, disabled. Uh, I think that's uh, an important piece of legislation. I hope it receives the support uh, of the, the House uh, and it uh, would augment uh, whatever previous settlement that there had been with them. Uh, nothing can uh, compensate for the injury that has been caused to them. Uh, but to, to leave people who have gone through that uh, severe pain, anguish, uh, and a prolonged period of living with a, a disability without giving them the assistance that they can because they weren't able to uh, provide employment they weren't able to build up national insurance and therefore are at a disadvantage uh, from the, the rest of the, the community. So I think it's an important piece of legislation for the House to look at and I hope that they will consider it sympathetically and support it. Call Mr Chris Hazard. 
the Minister for his answer thus far. Can the Minister outline uh, which recommendations have been implemented following the independent assessment of the VSS and which ones remain outstanding? Well, I think without going, because there were, there were a whole series of recommendations, uh, my recollection is that uh, we have, I think, already implemented about two thirds of the recommendations that uh, came before us. Uh, and I'm quite happy if the uh, OFM DFM committee wants us to give them further details on that issue. I'm quite happy to, to do that. But certainly, very considerable progress has already been made in the implementation uh, of the recommendations. Call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I, I want to acknowledge the First Minister's admission that his party was complicit in appointing what he had described as a dodgy character uh, as a commissioner. I'm sure government is not easy for the First Minister. Can I ask if this process uh, is being run, uh, a, a process which gives a list of deemed appointable candidates, and if so, how many people are currently deemed appointable? Well, I don't want to go into the, the details of, of an open competition, but I can assure them that uh, the process has been uh, monitored by the uh, Appointments Commission. It's being held in accordance with uh, their rules, regulations and guidelines, uh, and uh, they will bring forward to us those who are uh, appointable. There have been occasions, and I'll leave this issue to the side so that I can speak more frankly on the, the issue. There have been occasions when we have been left with very little choice uh, on one occasion, I can recall us being only offered one person to choose from. Uh, so I, I think if uh, the Deputy First Minister are being asked uh, to, to make choices, we would like a uh, wide field that we can look at uh, and uh, perhaps uh, agree on a, an outcome. Call Ms. Michelle Michael Veen for a question. Three, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, securing the powers to lower corporation tax is a key priority for the executive to promote the growth of uh, our local economy. As part of our economic pact, which was signed last year with the Prime Minister, the United Kingdom government indicated the intention to make a decision on the devolution of corporation tax powers at the time of the autumn statement. That's the 3rd of uh, December. This has involved discussions with the Secretary of State, and we also wrote to the Prime Minister to press him to come to a decision quickly and ensure the swift devolution of corporation tax powers. The reply from the Prime Minister confirmed the timescale remains the same. If a positive decision is made, officials have also been told the bill could be introduced to the House of Commons very shortly afterwards, but before the election. The Executive's uh, agreement will also then be required to approve the devolution of corporation tax rate setting powers and to lay a legislative consent motion before the Assembly. Officials are working to make the necessary arrangements in this respect. Call Mr. Datty Mackay. My apologies, Michelle, your supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I would like to thank the First Minister for his response. But further to that, what does he say to those who oppose corporation tax on the basis that it breaks up the fiscal union and who do not believe that the executive has the competence to deal with these increased powers? Well, I think we have seen since devolution began in Scotland that the fiscal responsibilities were being divided up between the Treasury and the devolved regions. The uh, government in Scotland, for instance, has had the power uh, to reduce or increase income tax uh, to within certain uh, limits. Uh, we already have proposals that uh, various duties, stamp duty, uh, the uh, ability for landfill uh, tax be devolved to Scotland and to, to Wales. Uh, and, of course, we ourselves have had uh, the, the power over our passenger duty. So that kind of tight fiscal uh, union uh, has, has already been, uh, I think, made more flexible. So I, I don't think that uh, that pertains. We have very separate, unique circumstances in Northern Ireland. We have a land frontier uh, with a, a country that has a considerably more attractive, i.e. lower, level of corporation tax. We have come through uh, decades uh, of uh, conflict in Northern Ireland. Uh, our economy suffered as a result of that uh, conflict. Uh, and therefore, I think there, there is a strong argument to make that uh, Northern Ireland, in order to rebalance its economy uh, as it is lagging behind because of uh, our, our history, uh, that uh, we need to have uh, something that grows the private sector, sector 
uh, and encourages uh, uh, growth uh, within the, the economy. In that uh, context, uh, no one has made a better suggestion than that of corporation tax, where it is viewed that over a period of time something like 50,000 additional jobs would come. And now you call Mr Mackay. Uh, just on, along the same lines, First Minister, um, could you outline in your own view what you believe the priorities should be in terms of other uh, fiscal levers aside uh, from corporation tax, and also what conversations uh, has your office had with the business community uh, to ensure they are uh, a part of this conversation too? Well, taking those in reverse, the one thing that you can say about our business community in Northern <coughs> Ireland, uh, they are always ready and willing to, to give advice on these and uh, other matters and have been doing so very consistently. Uh, and the overwhelming view of the, the business community is that uh, this will be good for business, that this will encourage growth, not just in terms of foreign direct investment, but also of our indigenous uh, companies and give them a confidence uh, for the, the future. In terms of uh, what other financial levers, uh, I think I said at a, a previous question time that uh, the Department of Finance and Personnel had looked at a whole range uh, of uh, fiscal powers to see which of them might be applicable to Northern Ireland, which might uh, give us some ability uh, in terms of uh, directing uh, our own social and economic policy in Northern Ireland, which ones we could afford to do, uh, which one the economy of scale would make it impossible for us to do. And at the end of that exercise, I think certainly the, the powers that were being offered to Scotland and Wales of uh, stamp duty uh, or of uh, the landfill tax, I might even add in aggregates tax uh, and corporation tax as well as uh, our passenger duty seem to be uh, the parameters within which we, uh, we would probably have to work. Any of the others uh, are of such complexity that a small area of 1.8 million people uh, would find it very difficult to pay the cost of uh, operating those uh, additional taxes uh, and without having to increase the burden uh, on our local community in order to pay for the cost of operation. Mr Danny Kenahan. Um, Deputy Speaker, and, um, does the Minister regret wasting time discussing the cost of devolving corporation tax with Her Majesty's Treasury when the decision was always going to be a political um, one made in number 10? Well, I think the, the member has uh, an imperfect knowledge of uh, the issues that relate to corporation tax. Uh, very significant discussions, indeed the bulk of discussions with the Treasury have been on the, the basis of how it would operate, what would the modus operandi be, uh, what are the arrangements uh, that would be made in terms of uh, whether there's any secondary benefits coming back to, to Northern Ireland, how you deal with uh, multinational companies that have a, a base uh, in Northern Ireland and their headquarters in, the, uh, in GB, what happens if they were to transfer the, the headquarters uh, and at attempt to get a, a larger base of uh, profits uh, into Northern Ireland. So there are a whole range of issues that had to be resolved before the political decision could be taken, uh, not least of, of which uh, relates to uh, how much of a reduction to the block grant would be made as a result of uh, our getting the, the, the lever of setting our own level of uh, corporation tax. Mr Stephen Agnew. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, could I ask the First Minister, given the um, furore his party has made about the 87 million um, that, that, that we've had to cut uh, to fund welfare. Um, how, how does he propose that we pay for potentially a 400 million per year cut uh, if, if corporation tax is reduced to the level that he's proposed? Well, first of all, the furore that he, he refers to, uh, I mean, I object to throwing money away. Uh, I do like to invest money. Uh, and that's the distinction between the, the two scenarios that he points out. Investing money in your economy to, to build it up and to grow it uh, seems a, an eminently sensible uh, position to, to adopt. Uh, and of course, the distinction in all of this is that everybody recognizes that what we need in Northern Ireland, uh, with the very high dependence that we ha dependency we have on the public sector, is to rebalance our economy. Everybody's been banding those words around for, for years. It's been the, the mantra of virtually every political party. I wonder, did they recognize what it actually meant? If you're going to rebalance your uh, economy, you streamline the public sector and you grow the private sector. 
uh, and the, the kind of thing that we're going to be forced to do because of what's been described as austerity uh, of uh, offering a voluntary exit scheme to reduce the uh, dependency we have of 212,000 people employed by the public sector. 212,000 for a population of 1.8 million. I think you can recognize that if you can reduce that level of dependency and at the same time grow your private sector, it is a better use uh, of the, the, the funds that are available. Uh, I, I don't think it will be as high as the, the member uh, is outlining, uh, but even if it were, uh, the uh, amount of money that you would take out of the, the public sector for a very limited number of people that would be coming out compared with the 50,000 that would be coming in over a period of years, I think on the balance book shows that it would be good value for money. Well, Mr. Jim Allister. Um, last week, one of the, uh, the First Minister's party colleagues described devolving corporation tax as a gamble. On the same theme as Mr. Agnew raised, how then can, does the First Minister reach the conclusion that it's safe to gamble with such a substantial adverse impact on the block grant, particularly as we're now most likely facing into further austerity and cuts in a new spending round review? Well, the member isn't much younger than me, so he's been around in politics for a very long period of time. And he knows that there are very few certainties in politics. Uh, to, to that extent, uh, all that you can ever do is make your best assessment of what the outcomes might be. The fact that uh, every significant commentator, economist, and politician who has financial experience all indicate that uh, the uh, provision of uh, corporation tax powers to the Northern Ireland Assembly and the consequent lowering uh, of the level of corporation tax will bring tens of thousands of jobs to Northern Ireland seems to me to be a fairly firm basis uh, for us to, to move uh, forward. I haven't heard any intelligent commentator indicate that it would not add to the number of people in employment in Northern Ireland. Our own Invest Northern Ireland very strongly support this and they're the people out on the ground right across the world and particularly in Northern Ireland and therefore the people who know best uh, what uh, the business community is looking for in order to increase investment or to bring investment to Northern Ireland. So all we ever do in all of these circumstances is take the best advice we can from the experiences of others uh, and the knowledge that we have ourselves and we act upon it. Call Ms. Pam Cameron for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four, please. Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister Jonathan Bell to answer this question. The Gender Equality Strategy 2006 to 2016 sets out an overarching framework for departments, their agencies, and other relevant statutory authorities to promote gender equality. The strategy provides a framework of objectives to direct action by decision makers and policy makers in government to increase their awareness, to increase their understanding, to tackle specific gender inequalities, including the structural inequalities that can perpetuate them, and to ensure the promotion of gender equality across their policy areas. The strategy and its supporting action plans bring together what government is doing here to promote gender equality and to enable government to demonstrate how it's meeting its international commitments under the Beijing Platform for Action and, importantly, the United Nations Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. A review of the strategy was undertaken during 2013, and in January 2014, Ministers approved the development of the new strategy. Since that date, meetings have taken place with a range of key stakeholders and the Gender Advisory Panel to update them on the progress that has been made and to include them, importantly, in the development of the new strategy. The current strategy will remain in place until the new strategy is developed and operational and will require full public consultation and, indeed, Executive approval. Call Mrs. Cameron for supplementary. 
Thank you, and uh, can I thank the junior minister for his answer? Can I ask if he um, has confidence in junior minister McCann um, in providing support for the domestic violence strategy, given the Maria Cahill revelations? I think Maria Cahill was a particularly brave individual to come forward uh, and to tell a, a story uh, of horrific rape, which should never have happened. And she can never be blamed. Child abuse can never, under any rational explanation, be blamed upon the child. And the House uh, considered this motion and I came to the correct decision, I believe, on it, and I voted on that. Uh, and my record is clear on that. Can I just say, as somebody who does have some experience of dealing with child abuse, I spent I think, nearly over two decades of my life in professional practice. A paedophile rarely, if ever, will only abuse one child. And I can give you a legion of research to confirm that. And the important thing is that when anybody is aware of child abuse, they must immediately bring that to the attention of the police and social services. They don't have an option not to bring that to the attention of police and social services. It's not something you should do. It is something you must do. And the reason why the criminal law is very clear that you must bring that forward is because it allows then the police and social services acting under the joint protocol procedures um, to, uh, it, it allows police and social services under the joint protocol procedures to act in a way that can take the criminal route but also can take a child protection route to protect any child. Now, there, whatever the abuse or the domestic violence, whether it's of an adult uh, or it's of a minor, whatever that abuse actually is, it is imperative that that abuse is reported and is reported immediately. And failure to do so is simply not an option. Call Dr. Alistair MacDonald. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And could I warmly welcome the First Minister and the Junior Minister's commitment to equality? But could I ask the First Minister how he possibly can reconcile the Executive's commitment to equality with the disgraceful, hurtful and insulting comments of his colleague Gregory Campbell at the DUP conference regarding the Irish language? And does he not, is he not aware that the Irish language community is much wider and deeper than the membership of any one or even question, two political please. parties? My didn't sound like it. understanding. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sorry. I hope not. Uh, the minister knows fine well he has the ability to answer the question or not. So, the, I think the understanding, Principal Deputy Speaker, was that, and I think most <laughs> members of the House are aware of that, was that the supplementary question was to be based upon the original question. So, I'll therefore answer what the original question was which was the gender equality strategy, uh, of which I don't think Mr Campbell said anything uh, on the gender equality strategy on that particular time. I think we've got a strong track record in the office of the First and Deputy First Minister, and we've got a strong action plan on what we have done in terms of actions that we've taken to promote gender equality. Uh, we have sought to find a gender balance on all government-appointed committees, on boards and on all other relevant official bodies. The uh, Commissioner for Public uh, Appointments has recognised that women, along with some other sections of the population, are underrepresented and they are working closely with government departments to identify and develop the measures to address the underrepresentation among those holding public appointments in Northern Ireland. There is one thing we have done. Northern Ireland civil service actions. We have committed to achieving greater diversity in public appointments. We have been consistent with the overall principle and selection by merit as a means of ensuring effective public bodies. We recognise that some sections of our society are underrepresented and we are working to encourage that greater participation. We have put in place the measures to raise the awareness of public appointments and made it possible and encouraged people to apply for those. And we've taken a number of steps 
uh, including interdepartmental public appointments forum to share best practice to increase diversity. And we have used the independence of advice which will be provided to the public appointments forum by a senior academic with considerable experience in equality and diversity issues. Time doesn't allow me to go on, but those are the key concrete actions that OFM, DFM have taken on gender equality and which we are proud to stand over. Before calling Mr Kieran McCarthy, can I remind members that we have only dealt with three questions. Can we have brevity both from the members and from the ministers? Mr McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the junior minister, uh, would he not agree that it would be better for Northern Ireland if we had a single Equality uh, Act um, as, as soon as possible, rather than trying to address uh, equality issues piecemeal, bearing in mind that in uh, GB it's almost five years ago since they introduced their Equality Act. I'm not sure that, you know, that uh, whatever body would change the legislation uh, that we have. We have very robust uh, legislation uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, we are using that legislation uh, to drive forward change to increase uh, the issue of uh, gender equality. Uh, we're doing that in, in a range of ways by using best practice, uh, advertisement, encouragement, setting an example uh, from within the Northern Ireland Civil Service. All of these are measures that are using best practice to address the issue of gender equality. I suppose if I could say to the member, I'm more interested in what the outcome is. Uh, than the process. We have the process and we have the legislation. Whatever body we have will not change the legislation. Um, the important thing for people who are uh, living with uh, inequality uh, is that we address that gender imbalance and we're using best practice to do that. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Question six, Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, work is uh, progressing across all seven headline actions that were announced alongside the publication of Together Building a United Community. The Minister of Education announced the first three successful projects to be taken forward onto the Shared Campuses program on the 2nd of July. A second call for projects has now opened. In respect of the United Youth program, we have successfully completed the first pilot and a concept design call has attracted a high level of interest. A design team has been established to take forward development of the next stage of the programme. Stakeholder engagement is ongoing with a view to commencing a further pilot phase in January of 2015. With regard to summer schools, a significant number of schools and camps have already taken place during the summer of 2014, and further schemes were delivered during the Halloween midterm break. In relation to urban villages, stakeholder engagement is ongoing regarding the development of the first two locations announced at uh, Lower Newton Arge Road and Collin. Detailed project plans complete with uh, anticipated budgets have also been developed in respect of shared neighbourhoods, interface uh, removal and cross-community sports programme headline actions. Workers continue with the departments to take forward work in relation to the wide range of other actions and commitments arising from the strategy. <coughs> Decree for supplement. I thank the First Minister for his response. First Minister, can you uh, detail the actual spend in the current financial year and also the projected spend for the rest of 2015-16 uh, by departments for the TBUC expenditure in total? Well, uh, the, the member touches on a, an important point as one that's being raised within OFM DFM at the present time. Uh, these were new projects, therefore they weren't baselined. Uh, and therefore we have had to, to bid for funds. We have been able to get sufficient funds in order to carry out the pilots and to do the uh, preparatory work that was necessary for the schemes. Uh, however, we do need to identify where the funds are going to come from uh, to deal with the 2015-16 financial year. Uh, we have not identified <coughs> those funds yet. We will have further conversations with the Minister of Finance and personnel, I put them on notice, uh, in order that we do identify funds for these projects. I think they are hugely important. When I look, for instance, at the United Youth uh, Project, uh, we have carried out uh, a pilot, uh, and that is taking uh, young people who would be in the NEETS category uh, and putting them into the, the, the project. Uh, we found that 84 per cent of those who went through that project 
have ended up either uh, in work, in training, or in uh, some form of uh, community or charitable organisation uh, giving support. Uh, that's a massive change, and uh, if one were to hear some of the transformational stories of the young people who were part of that project, uh, I think uh, they would convince this House, and I hope they will convince the Minister of Finance uh, that this is a project that is worth funding. Order. Unfortunately, that ends uh, the period for list of questions, and we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mr. Ross Hussey. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the First Minister agree with me and condemn the uh, threats made against Mr. Gregory Campbell, MP, MLA, uh, and would he roundly condemn them and those responsible for such irresponsible actions? I do, of course. Uh, we have been consistent on this issue because there have been members from all sides of this House who have been threatened in one way or another. And a threat uh, against uh, anyone who represents the uh, local community as a democratically elected representative. Uh, when such an attack pla takes place, it's an attack on democracy itself. Uh, I, I trust that uh, the early knowledge that the police have of the, uh, the issue will help them to prevent uh, anything from uh, arising from it. Uh, but uh, certainly I condemn it uh, completely. Uh, I thank the member for his question. Uh, and uh, I know that the, uh, the member for East Londonderry will not be deterred from doing the good job that he does for the constituents he has in East Londonderry, both here and in Parliament. Call Mr Hussey for supplementary. Would the, the First Minister agree with me that the, the history of the Irish language is associated very closely with the Presbyterian Church. In fact, the Presbyterian ministers kept that language alive. And would he agree with me that such an attack on Mr Campbell would actually make that support for the Irish language within the unionist community step back because of what they see as terrorism being associated with the Irish language? Well, I, I think it certainly would be counterproductive. I have to say that I, I, I don't point the finger at uh, those who have a real and genuine interest in the, the Irish language. Uh, I suspect that the, the culprits will be someone who perhaps couldn't care less about the Irish language except for using it for political purposes. Uh, yes, the, the Irish language does have a, a history that uh, has roots within Presbyterianism uh, in Ireland as it uh, then was, uh, and uh, it's a, a perfectly honourable uh, entitlement for anyone to advance the Irish language and to speak the Irish, Irish language and uh, of course we respect those who do. Uh, I think that uh, we, we really do need to, to separate and recognise the difference uh, between uh, support for the Irish language and those who want to use the Irish language for political purposes. Mr Michael Bajumsi for topical questions. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the First Minister, and not for the first time have I asked OFM, DFM, bearing in mind that 53% of the civil service is female, uh, we're looking at permanent secretaries, 100% male, we're looking at grade threes within the senior civil service, over 70% female. When are we going to see progress in finding equality and balance uh, in those posts? Well, I, I very much uh, encourage those. Uh, within the civil service uh, who are female and who have the ability to apply for all of the, the jobs that come up at the higher levels of the, the civil service. Uh, I think at the same time we must always make sure that jobs, uh, are, uh, 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 job appointments are made on the, the basis of uh, merit. Uh, and uh, Of course we have had uh, females in very high positions, including permanent secretaries, uh, within the, uh, the civil service. Uh, I hope that we can get back to that. Uh, my own experience of, of uh, the female participation in the higher echelons of the, the civil service has been a positive one, uh, and I, I hope that uh, the member isn't uh, indicating, and I hope certainly that it isn't the case, that there is any glass ceiling within the, the civil service. Uh, it must be open to, to all on the basis of their ability to do the job. Mr. Bajemsi for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Uh, and I would find it encouraging. Uh, but, of course, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating. 
and this is a situation that we have been looking at for a number of years and we appear to be unable to make progress. Uh, and therefore, could I ask him, uh, uh, through his position, uh, to take a personal interest in this, to ensure that with 11 departments, every single permanent secretary is male, not a female uh, uh, employed, uh, and a similar situation are almost as bad at grade three and also at grade five level, that this is wholly unacceptable and that it is something that uh, all of us uh, should be endeavouring to ensure that when he says no glass ceiling, we can demonstrate it and prove it. Well, I take on board what the member says, and uh, I do entirely endorse the thrust of his remarks. I would just say this to him, that it is a lot more difficult uh, to end up with the outcomes that uh, he is referring to in circumstances where we are downsizing uh, the, the public sector or indeed reducing the number of government departments because that clearly takes out a, a whole level of uh, positions at, at each level within the, the civil service. Uh, but uh, I have no doubt and I, I'm pretty sure that I speak for the Deputy First Minister when I, I say this, as far as OFM, DFM is concerned, uh, we would repudiate anything that was standing in the way of full equality, gender equality, in terms of positions at any level within the, the public service. Uh, and uh, we're quite happy to champion that cause, uh, and there will certainly be no distinction on our part uh, on the basis of gender. Uh, we'll be looking at who is the best person to do a job, uh, and uh, I hope that that's the position that the various panels will exercise. And I think we should remember that these kind of uh, appointments are governed by guidelines uh, and rules which would forbid any form of discrimination. Mr. Rosalie McCordy. Karamaya Glas Concordia, Kaskombuya Slash Naira, Asa Ragri Gujisha. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. A Kogail de Farchi, Rin Gregory Campbell Masla, Arngelica, Augusar Gail Gori, Namil Chapaschi Scullia in a mask, Ata Golf Rage, Gail Ejikas, Arwila Ear or Gregory Campbell, a Kudge Fuckle, a Haran Shear. Uh, at your party conference, Gregory Campbell again insulted the Irish language and Irish speakers, including thousands of children going through Irish medium education. Would you uh, consider asking Jerry, Jeff Gregory Campbell to withdraw his remarks, please? Mr Deputy Speaker, I think we really do need to distinguish between lampooning those who are involved in a political campaign related to the Irish language and those who genuinely speak the Irish language. Uh, I have known Gregory Campbell for decades uh, and uh, I know his dry sense of humour as well uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, his uh, finger was being pointed uh, at those who in my view politically abuse the, the Irish language because quite frankly uh, I think they set back the prospects of the acceptance of the Irish language uh, among many other sections of the, the, the community. Uh, I'm uh, fully supportive uh, of uh, those who enjoy speaking the, the Irish language, they enjoy the, the richness of the language and the, the culture surrounding it, uh, and they must be protected. Uh, but uh, I, I think when it starts to get drawn into the uh, political realm, then we start to uh, undermine and dilute the importance of, of the, the language. So I, I just say as a, a matter uh, of interest for those who are speakers, the more we can do to depoliticize uh, the Irish language, I think the greater the acceptance there will be of that language within the community. McCarley for supplementary. Uh, can I ask the Minister, how can you claim to respect other culture and identities whenever you defend and, and indeed echo those same comments at your party conference? Gore Mayogad. Well, I, I think that we, we see evidence of uh, a question that had been prepared before I had given uh, an answer. Uh, I made it very clear during my own remarks at uh, the party conference that uh, this community will only go forward when there is a higher level of uh, respect and understanding and, and tolerance. That has to be the way forward, yeah. but it has to be the way not just for the Irish language, but for the Unionist and Orange traditions uh, yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it uh, ill becomes anybody on the one hand to feel offence uh, when it's something that relates to the Irish language, but close their eyes and ignore the fact that there are people on those benches opposite 
who have uh, made comments about the royal family, about the orange institutions, about parades uh, in Northern Ireland, and many other par parts of the, the culture and tradition uh, of uh, the unionist community. So, uh, as I said at the party conference, it's essential that uh, this is not a one-way street, that everybody recognises the importance to respect, understand and tolerate the other's uh, tradition. Mr Stuart Dixon for a topical question. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Thank you, First Minister. First Minister, can I join, first of all, with others to clearly condemn the threats made against Mr Campbell today? Mm -hmm. First Minister, you described Mr Campbell's remarks on Saturday as, and I quote, a bit of comedy. Can I ask you, First Minister, who's laughing? Well, when he first uh, made the remarks in this chamber, there were a lot of people opposite laughing. <laughs> Call Mr. Dixon for supplementary. First Minister, by describing another party's proposals as toilet paper, does that mean the DUP have already written off any chance of agreement in the current talks? Well, I think Mr. Campbell was very careful to use the word wish list. Uh, as opposed to the uh, serious agenda items that we are discussing in the talks process. Uh, I am fully committed and the party is fully committed uh, to reach agreement on the wide range of issues that are being discussed as part of the agenda within the, the talks process. Uh, indeed, if uh, we collectively fail in reaching uh, an agreement, uh, it says little for the future of this Assembly and Executive. So it is very important that we do reach agreement. That is why there has always been uh, a reluctance uh, on our part, and as I understood it on the part of his party as well, uh, to stretch the agenda, to deal with the wish list uh, issues, the hobby horses of each of us, because we all have them in our own political parties and we know that. Uh, I think there are key central issues that need to be resolved within the process, and I think that is where our focus and attention has to be. Call Mr Samuel Gardner for a topical question. Deputy Speaker. Has the First Minister had any discussions with the United Kingdom Government on replacement of the Barnett formula? Well, it has come up, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in a number of uh, conversations. Uh, there would not be a lot of enthusiasm uh, in Northern Ireland for a replacement to the, the Barnett formula. Uh, the Barnett formula, if it is removed, I suspect there will be massive political pressure from the north of England. Uh, and indeed from Wales uh, for a recalculation of that formula, which uh, would uh, be to the detriment if we have to spread the cake, we'll, uh, or maybe cut the cake up differently rather than spreading it, uh, it would uh, lead to us getting a smaller portion. Uh, that being the case, while it has been discussed, I was pleased that the Prime Minister, uh, as a, an outcome of the Scottish referendum, was indicating that they had no intention to replace the Barnett formula. Mr. Gardner for his supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the First Minister thus far. But will the First Minister outline the main arguments he will use to keep Northern Ireland block grant at the current level of uh, the event of the redistribution of finance following the Scottish referendum? Well, I, I think it comes back close to the, the issues that we were arguing in relation to cooperation tax. Uh, we have uh, come from a position where there has been uh, massive division in our community. Uh, our economy uh, needs as much support as it can uh, to, to be able to stand on its own two feet. Uh, for all of those reasons, the need factor is high in Northern Ireland. Uh, I could easily make an argument for a, a higher proportion of that, uh, that formula than we presently get in terms of the distribution within whatever the funds that are available. But I can certainly make an argument as to why the amount that we are receiving in block grant should be uh, increased. Because in real terms, uh, over the last four or five years, we have uh, lost the equivalent of £1.5 billion pounds of spending. Uh, and uh, all of the difficulties that we are facing in relation to uh, the cuts that ministers are having to, to contemplate uh, come as a result uh, of the uh, reduction that there is in our block grant. So whatever the calculation and formula may be, the overall pot, I think, needs to be considered. And there are issues that we have to deal with in Northern Ireland which are unique within the United Kingdom. Uh, and therefore, whatever the Barnet formula might be, I think there's a very good argument for us to have Barnet Plus. Mr. Bronwyn McGavin. 
Bilgut. Uh, First Minister, given your recent comments about the Equality Commission uh, regarding the Asher case, can you confirm that, that OFM, DFM is fully committed to the work of the Equality Commission in identifying and challenging all forms of discrimination? Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, OFM, DFM has uh, a statutory ownership uh, of the Equality Commission, uh, but it does not have any operational responsibility. Uh, the Equality Commission itself uh, has a uh, duty and remit that requires it to uh, uphold equality for everyone, and that has to include Christians as well as those who are not. Order. That time is up.